Hello and welcome to our weekly look inside Syria. I'm Hazem Sika. Well, the head of the Syria National Coalition has intensified his push for talks with President Bashar al-Assad's government, despite criticism and opposition from his colleagues in the coalition. Moaz al-Khatib went as far as identifying this man, Farouk al-Shara'a, Syria's deputy president, as the figure with whom he would like to begin talks. On Tuesday, Khatib, who met a number of Western officials in Germany, said... Since the start of the conflict, Farouk al shara knew that things were not going the right way. Just because shara is part of the regime doesn't mean we can't talk to him. I'm asking the regime to commission shara if the regime accepts, for talks with us. Where's the problem with that? The issue is now in the state's court to accept negotiations for departure with fewer losses. The regime must take a clear stand and we say we will extend our hand for the interests of the people and to help the regime leave peacefully. Well, the initiative from the head of the SNC to talk to Assad's government came with certain conditions, mainly the release of 160,000 prisoners and the extension of passports held by Syrian citizens. In a statement on state television on Friday, Syria's information minister had this to say. <laughs> I invite all opposition forces inside Syria and all armed fighters who lay down their weapons to join the process of dialogue. They will be partners in achieving a political solution to the crisis. I also invite all opposition forces to join this process and to adhere to our national interests by rejecting external interference, maintain sovereignty and denounce violence. Well, the U.S. has strongly backed Khatib's moves to open dialogue with Bashar al-Assad's government to end almost two years of fighting. But the State Department spokeswoman Victoria Newland stressed that the United States position remained unchanged on bringing to account those on both sides who have committed atrocities. Earlier this week, U.S. Vice President Joe Biden met Moaz al-Khatib in Munich. Biden said he had urged Khatib, and we're quoting, to isolate extremists within the broader opposition and to reach out to and be inclusive of a broad range of communities inside Syria. Well, joining us to discuss this are our guests in Washington, Najib Ghadbian, member of the Syrian National Coalition and its representative in the U.S., also in Washington, D.C., Hillary Mann Leverett, professor of U.S. foreign policy at the American University and co-author of the new book, Going to Tehran, Why the United States Must Come to Terms with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Ms. Leverett is also a former State Department and National Security Council official under Presidents Clinton and Bush. And in Beirut, we have Joseph Kachishian, a Middle East analyst and a columnist for the Gulf News newspaper. Mr. Khadbadbian, if I could uh, start with you and uh, this uh, latest move uh, for, for talks. This is, of course, the, the latest in a series of uh, uh, tentative uh, peace feelers made by spokesmen on both sides. Uh, do you support, first of all, uh, the, the leader of the uh, Syrian National Council, uh, Moaz Khatib's uh, offer of, of uh, uh, talks, uh, even if it means uh, keeping Bashar al-Assad in power? Uh, we do support Mr. Al Khatib's uh, political initiative uh, in its uh, key components, which the opposition has in fact uh, agreed upon. Those elements uh, do include uh, number one, uh, we are talking about uh, reaching out to members of the regime who have not committed atrocities against the Syrian people. And uh, we are talking about the second point, the departure of this regime. Um, now, the Mr. Al Khatib's in its uh, initial uh, proposal uh, may be introduced um, uh, two uh, conditions to test the goodwill and the willingness of the regime, in fact, uh, to be serious. Uh, but later on, he elaborated on those, and, and the full, I think, uh, proposal will be presented uh, by the National Coalition in, in its upcoming meeting. But the previous position of your group was that uh, any uh, offer of talks would not even uh, be considered uh, as long as Bashar al-Assad remains in power. It now appears that that uh, demand has been dropped. Is that uh, a recognition uh, that perhaps things are not in moving in the direction that you had hoped? Um, I think that may not be an accurate reading of, of our position. Um, the, a lot of the political initiatives and efforts, as you uh, mentioned early on, um, including the Arab League second initiative, 
uh, talked about the uh, stepping down of Assad or the actually delegation of Assad's authority to his vice president. Uh, and we endorse that position because we see Assad as the main obstacle to reaching a political solution. And he's, in fact, one of the key individuals um, uh, responsible for the crimes against humanity committed uh, against the Syrian people. So he's not an acceptable negotiating partner. Um, having said that, again, um, I think the interpretation of Geneva Accord uh, talk about the, the uh, transitional government with full executive powers um, that's acceptable to both sides. And I could assure you that the, uh, all of the opposition, uh, the revolutionary forces, the FSA, will not accept Bashar al-Assad. Hillary Mann Leverett, what do you make of these uh, latest moves at diplomacy? Well, I think I think they're very important. <coughs> Excuse me. I think they're very important and really the only way forward. I've been saying now for nearly two years that the only way forward uh, in Syria and for what's happening in Syria is diplomacy, is a political way forward for political reconciliation and power sharing. The key thing, though, that has changed, of course, we've seen now these changes in the Syri among the Syrian oppositionists, but the key thing that has changed is here in Washington, is in the White House, in the U.S. government. Two major uh, developments happened. One is I would call the Benghazi effect, where the administration, the Obama administration, became a little less enamored with arming, funding, and training oppositionists to overthrow a sitting government. And the second is that inside the, the Obama administration, they became a little bit less attached to what I would call the delusion that trying to overthrow the Assad government would somehow lead to the overthrow of the Iranian government. These two things have changed, I think, in some important ways within the U.S. government. It's not unanimous, but they're they have changed. And so you would no longer have, I think, this idea out there that the United States would come to the rescue, arm, fund, and train people to overthrow the Syrian government. That has set in train a series of important political possibilities where now members of the opposition and others have to see a negotiated settlement as maybe their only viable way forward. My hope is that uh, with Lakhdar Brahimi, the UN envoy, who's very experienced in these matters, there would be a way forward similar to the Taif Accord that he negotiated to end the civil war in Lebanon. My concern is, though, that took 15 years and tens of thousands of Lebanese. Here we've had two years and tens of thousands of Syrians. I hope that at this point we can look at a Taif type accord that was used in Lebanon to end the bloodshed in Syria uh, and everybody can get serious. But the real change is uh, things that are happening here in Washington, that we are no longer goading and fanning the flames, uh, potentially no longer goading and fanning, fanning the flames for war and bloodshed in Syria as a way to overthrow the government in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Joseph Kashishian, a negotiated uh, settlement, the only way forward. But what do you read as well into the timing uh, of these moves? In the civil war, leaders or aspiring, aspiring leaders always seek political solutions. But in a civil war, there are no political solutions, really. The process of getting to a ceasefire or stopping the conflict is what we are talking about. At the end of the day, this is a process to gain time so that people position themselves better on the ground to acquire lethal weapons that eventually will make sure that one side or the other wins this conflict. I think that it is important not to put too much emphasis on the political negotiations that are going on right now. The civil war is two years on. Regrettably, it will go on for many more years. Uh, and the reference to Lebanon uh, a few uh, moments ago is really uh, not Lakhdar Ibrahimi. We should not give him, him credit for having the Taif Accord. That was the work of Rafiq Hariri, not Lakhdar Ibrahimi. And the civil war in Lebanon, one could argue, is still not over. We are still in the phase of negotiating an ultimate solution. So therefore, I think that in Syria, what is going on right now with all these negotiations is a very complicated process where people are positioning themselves for the day after. But we're a long, long way from an end to, a, to this conflict. Uh, Najib, uh, this idea that yeah, this ahead. idea that arming and supplying this idea that arming and supplying people to overthrow their government is not only a strategic mistake; it is a moral failure of catastrophic proportions. The United States and our so-called allies have pushed that in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Libya, and now in Syria. We have done that to the cost of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of lives, especially Arab and Muslim lives. We do that particularly today with no sense, no hope whatsoever 
whatsoever that arming, funding, and training people like this will lead to the strategic outcomes that we want. It would be bad enough if we armed, tra trained, and funded people to kill civilians, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about transforming a traditional battlefield into a civilian one. It would be bad enough but if we could actually coerce that outcome at the end of the day, but now the United States can no longer do that. Do so we're literally just doing it with civilian, with civilian tragedy on the ground, with no hope it's for an actual outcome that we want. Joseph, Joseph, it's go not going to help. It's not going to help to really uh, kind of uh, uh, take the moral high ground. Obviously, a civil war is bloody, and this has nothing to do really with the United States. The United States is a spectator here more than anything else by its own choice. Uh, it is not intervening. That's fine. That's uh, serving U.S. interest. What's going on on the ground is that you have an uprising, a genuine revolution on the part of very courageous Syrians who are tired of living under a dictatorship. And they are putting their, their lives on the line on a daily basis to make sure that they acquire liberty and freedom. That, at the end of the day, is what this is all about. And regrettably, a lot of people have died. A lot of people will certainly die. But the end game is going to be the removal of a regime that the Syrian people, not the United States or any other power, that the Syrian people no longer wish to have. All right. Uh, we were I'll told the same story in Iraq and Lebanon, it, then, Iraq, Libya, and Afghanistan. It was wrong every I, time. All, all right, it leads I'll, to is I'll more let, dead I'll bodies. You, I'll let you make your point briefly, Hillary Mann Leverett. But then after that, I want to bring in uh, Najib. Yeah, we've been told this same fantasy, that it's just people on the ground just trying to have a better life, just trying to bring about an end to repressive rule. We're told the same story in Iraq, in Libya, in Afghanistan, and now in Syria. The fact of the matter is the United States and our so-called allies use potentially the seeds of popular unrest, popular resentment and dissatisfaction. We use that as a tool to produce regime change, to get a regional political and security order that is pro-American over the wishes of people on the ground. That has led to disastrous outcomes in each of these countries, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, Libya, and now in Syria. The only thing here that we, that we can have as a hope for the way forward is real political reconciliation, dialogue, and power sharing. All and right. in fact, that is what Lakhtar Brahimi did in Lebanon, he did in Iraq, Najib, he did in Afghanistan, and we should give him a chance to do it in Syria. Najib Gadbi, and you were shaking your head to uh, some of what you uh, heard there. Obviously, you've got a different take on this. Uh, absolutely. Uh, let me just agree with what uh, uh, Joseph said uh, toward the end in setting up the background and the, the record to what we're talking about. We're not talking about uh, civil war. We're not talking about, I think, bringing in other examples uh, and, and using paradigms that do not apply to Syria does not help understand the situation. This is an uprising by Syrians, started peaceful. It's a continuation of the Arab Spring of people demanding their basic rights of freedom and dignity. And the end game, as Joseph said, is very clear. This this regime will go. And uh, the question from our point of view in the opposition is uh, we want to do this with the least cost. It's already been highly costly in terms of human lives and material destruction. So this is, I think, is a very important point. The second point I take uh, issue with your guest from Washington uh, is this is not about the U.S. This is not a U.S.-led uh, uh, uprising. This is not Iraq. This is not Libya. In fact, the U.S. has not been coming forward in supporting um, the Syrian people and, and, and their rights to, to defend themselves uh, uh, against uh, this brutal regime that uses um, tanks, air force, Scud missiles to, to destroy cities. So I think we need to be clear about understanding the nature of this conflict. Um, now, uh, do we need a political solution to end this? Absolutely. All conflicts end with, with political solutions. Uh, and I think the parameters of this political solution have been um, presented by inter international uh, organizations like the Arab League, which we endorsed early on, and now some of the elements, in fact, of the Ibrahims, including the Geneva Accord, which they do provide some useful bases uh, for us to, in fact, uh, say to, to the Syrians first that we have a political vision, uh, we have a clear um, uh, understanding of, of how this is going to end, and uh, it, in fact, to the international community as well. All right. Look, we've been told for two years, we've been told by two years that this is a peaceful uprising. A peaceful uprising by people that are willing to sit outside of Syria until and fight over no, every no, last nobody's Syrian. Saying peaceful. This Stop is not a peaceful, peaceful for uprising. Months. For I'm two sorry, years we've been told that, and for two years we've been told the answer is that all, all we have to see is Bashar al-Assad has to go. This is not, in, in fact, a continuation of the Arab uprising or the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening. This was it a is. concerted it attempt is. by the Absolutely. United States and our allies to abort the Arab Awakening, to abort it. 
it and change it from something that would lead to actual real political participation by people throughout the Middle East, an attempt to then turn the regional balance of power against the Islamic Republic of Iran. The focus here has been from the beginning for two years to use the Syrian people, the civilian battlefield there, to overthrow the government in Syria in order to bring about the overthrow of the Islamic Republic of Iran. That's what it's been about from here for two oh. years. Well, I appreciate there are uh, obviously passionate voices being expressed on uh, uh, both sides of, of this, but I want to talk about uh, the territorial uh, situation for a moment, and then we'll get back to the discussion. As the leader of the opposition is hoping to engage in talks with Assad's government, the fighters on the ground are hoping to achieve more gains. In the city of Aleppo, rebels are seeking the upper hand now that they have taken control of a district in the southeast. The territorial gain has blocked the government's only land route into areas it controls in western Aleppo. But as Zeyna Khoda reports, it is fighting back. This is the first major gain by rebels in Aleppo in months, after they forced government soldiers out of the Sheikh Said district in the southeast of the city. But those soldiers didn't go far. They are now positioned less than 200 meters away. This highway is all that divides the two sides. It's a key road. It links Aleppo airport to areas in the city under government control. In effect, the rebels have cut off the army's ability to resupply its troops by land. This supply line is strategic for the regime. They send supplies from Damascus and other areas by air to the airport, and then they use the highway. The rebels have been trying to break the military stalemate in Aleppo city. They know that they can't do this just by taking territory. They need to capture strategic territory. That is why the rebel push into Sheikh Said district is a threat to the government. Many of its residents were supporters of the Syrian government. They fled with the army. This is what's left. And the government is still using heavy firepower to try to retake Sheikh Said. We know that they are sending reinforcements, but recently they aren't able to use their planes that much. Aleppo's international airport and the adjacent Nairab military base are still operational. In the distance, you can see government troops who have been defending the facility. The rebels still haven't been able to prevent jet fighters from landing but they have surrounded the airport, blocking all roads to areas under their control. They're bringing in supplies and soldiers using civilian aircraft, so we can't hit them all the time. But when we take the airport, they'll lose control of Aleppo. The government can no longer send reinforcements to Aleppo using the main highways from Damascus and the coastal city of Latakia. This has been a long fight. Cutting the supply lines could give the rebels the upper hand for now, at least. Zana Khudr Al Jazeera, Aleppo City. So a reflection there that uh, regardless of what happens on the diplomatic front, uh, the fighting uh, on the ground continues uh, unabated. And Najib uh, Ghadbian, if I could turn back to you on this, the problem, uh, many people say, with the rebel uh, movement is that it remains highly decentralized and deeply distrusts the, reg the regime. For that reason, aren't many of these groups unlikely to stop fighting as long as Assad remains president? Well, um, I think at one point, the fact that the uh, Free Syrian Army was decentralized was actually uh, has some positive element uh, because had it had a centralized structure, it would have been easier to attack it, taking into account the uh, imbalance in the military uh, power between the two sides. The regime has all of these uh, arsenal of weaponry, including heavy weapons, uh, aircraft, etc., while the fighters have basic uh, individual weapons. But at this point, I think, as we move to the next phase, we do need to make sure that all of these forces are unified. And in fact, the, the process has been uh, started. Um, we have now a centralized um, command under General Salim Idris, and uh, a lot of strides have been, in fact, made in, into that direction. So uh, as we see this unification, um, and, and as we see more support coming in, I think we are going to see serious shift on the ground. Joseph Kajishian, uh, how do you see the rebels on the ground at the moment? Do they remain a, a pretty uh, disparate uh, group? Can they be controlled? Uh, well, this is the $25,000 question. Uh, the opposition, the Syrian opposition's fundamental failure during the past two years is that it has not been able to unify. Uh, but uh, the revolution is going on and the uprising is going on. And every day you have 5,000 Syrians who are leaving the country because of the continued war. Lebanon itself, 
technically is supposed to have 260,000 refugees, according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, but that number is probably double that, and we have about 3,000 individuals crossing the border legally or illegally every day. Pretty soon, 20% of the population of this country is going to made up is going to be made up of Syrians, and the war will continue, which means that a lot more refugees are going to spill over into Lebanon, into Jordan, into Iraq, and into Turkey. So obviously, this is a this is a tragedy. But un until such time, when the so-called allies of the opposition, whether it is the Arab worlds, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, other countries that are providing uh, logistical assistance, weapons assistance, or whether some Western countries that are directly or indirectly involved, like France and Britain and other countries as well, until such time when these guys get serious about providing real help to the opposition, I think that we're going to continue to see the situation on the ground deteriorate more and more. And the government itself, let's not forget, the government of Syria is relying on lethal weapons, including the Air Force, to literally destroy the country one building at a time. At the end of the day, as I said at the very beginning of my intervention, uh, negotiations are wonderful to accomplish ceasefires and to stop the conflict. But at the end of the day, one side must win this conflict in order for dramatic changes to occur in this region. And we'll wait and see what happens. Hillary, let's come back to you on this. You make the case uh, uh, that ca a case can be made, of course, uh, for, for not getting involved in this. But uh, isn't there an equally or perhaps more compelling case uh, against doing nothing? Well, I'm not saying doing nothing. I think that, that also would be a mistake. What I'm saying is diplomacy, that we should be pursuing diplomacy, political reconciliation, power sharing. This is the type, this is real, this would be the political solution. That is what has happened in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. This is not going to be an ideal solution. Lebanon today is not an ideal solution, but it is certainly light years better than it was during the Civil War. That's what we need going forward. But part of the, the fantastical narrative that we're fed is that somehow this, this opposition, this disparate opposition that is divided by ethnicity, by sect, by ideology, by agenda, by foreign backer, that this, this group of oppositionists is somehow going to come together with just a little bit more weaponry to kill just a few more Syrians, that somehow that's going to work. That is not only fantastical, that is just wrong. It is not going to work. It hasn't worked for two years. What they don't, what they need is not more weapons. What they need is diplomacy, is a political way forward through power sharing. And that can be done, even in incredibly difficult situations like in Lebanon. The alternative is not more fantasy that the opposition is going to come together. The alternative is even if they are able to, by some miracle, kill Bashar al-Assad, the alternative is not that the Assad government and the supporters of it, which is probably about 50 percent of the population, they're not going to go away. What you're going to end up happening is have deep divides in Syrian society, maybe divided territory, the curving up of Syria, and then places like Aleppo are not going to be run by some fantastical opposition government. They're going to be run by militias and warlords. That's what we're in for. That's what we have in Benghazi, and that's what we're going to get in Syria if we per continue to pursue military people on the ground instead of pursuing real power sharing, political reconciliation and diplomacy. Well, that's surely a scenario, uh, Najib, that you don't want to see. And I'll give the last word to you on that. Uh, absolutely. There seems to be misunderstanding of the situation in Syria, uh, trying to impose other, again, models like Lebanon and use uh, the civil war in Lebanon uh, as, you know, maybe a paradigm to understand Syria is absolutely not the case. Uh, again, this is a case of Syrian people want to change their government to one of the basic human rights uh, available to them. They started peaceful. This then turned militarized because the regime continued to, to use repression and killing and destruction against Syrian people. All right. uh, I think there is no such thing as power sharing with this regime. The Syrian people are going to win. All right. And on that, we're going to have to leave it. Uh, my thanks to all three of our guests uh, in Washington, Najib Radbien and Hillary Mann Leverett and in Beirut, Joseph Kashishian. Many thanks for your time. And thank you for joining us. Remember, Al Jazeera has extensive coverage of what's going on in Syria, not just on this program, but on our On the Hour news bulletins and online at aljazeera.com. I'm Hazem Seeker. Thanks for joining us. The news is next.